Um, thank you for your affection and please join me in welcoming Ruth. Um, and she'll be talking today about gender and labor, comparing the Great Depression and the Great Recession. I don't think I've ever been introduced like that before, but it's extremely Hopefully it wasn't thank you. inaccurate. <laughs> absolutely wonderful. I don't know if I deserve all that praise, but it was fantastic. So thank you, Jennifer. Um, I advise you to wait to do a book like that until you got tenure. It takes a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. All right. Well, so what I want to talk about today is quite different and actually goes back to my salad days. As you know that expression. You know, it's for chefs when they're first starting out there in salad. So, from um, the very beginning of my uh, career as a researcher, um, so the very first project I ever did was a study of um, what happened to women workers in the Great Depression of the 1930s. And then when the crash of 2008 came along, something I had been told all my childhood that it was coming, it was just a question of when, not whether. <laughs> um, I thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting to like, look back at that and sort of think about what's changed and what's the same and so on. So that's what I'm going to try to do. Um, and um, I should start by telling you that when I did the original project long ago, I was a budding Marxist feminist, as what we call ourselves then, or sometimes socialist feminist. And um, I thought that women were, I, before I did any research, that women were a reserve army of labor who were pulled into the labor force during um, periods of labor shortage, pushed out during periods of labor surplus, and therefore in the Depression, I assumed I would find um, they were pushed out. Um, so that's sort of where I went into it, thinking. And you should understand this was in the 1970s when um, research on these kinds of questions was just kind of, uh, we were um, at the very beginning of what became this enormous body of women's history research and so on. So. Well, there wasn't really any secondary literature on the topic. I just sort of thought that's what I would find, but instead, okay, so what I found instead. And that data, of course, are kind of limited by, by today's standards. Um, instead, to my surprise, I discovered that men's unemployment rates were higher than women's for the two years for which there are decent national data, which are just from the, the census um, counts of 1930 and 1940. So all right, that was a little bit of a puzzle. And, um, well, so um, I eventually figured out, which now seems kind of obvious, the reason for this was to do with job segregation by gender, which sort of launched me into a whole study of that, but that's another topic. Um, and as you probably noticed, um, that's not gone. We still have job segregation by gender. And it's not because they're women, but the jobs that um, women are concentrated most in are less sensitive to the ups and downs of um, economic crises than those that men are concentrated in construction, for example. Very volatile, as we saw again very recently, and was also true in the 30s. In those days, manufacturing was more important than it is now, but in both those sectors, men predominate, and those are the sectors that collapse first and most severely in a uh, severe economic downturn like those. So, so, okay, so that industry was solved. But anyway, that's where I began. And in fact, um, as you'll see, this is more or less the same pattern repeats itself um, now. So that also created problems, or issues, I shouldn't say problems, really. Um, but people at the time certainly saw them as problems. Um, in families, because, um, you know, you had a lot of households where women could find work and men couldn't. And, um, that created what, again, I, I, as a young feminist, thought well, this is great. You know, the women are in charge, they have the jobs, and um, the, the sociologists in those days, including Mira Komarovsky, I don't know if you all know that name, but she later became a well known um, sociologist at Columbia University, um, called sex role reversals. That was the terminology back then. And what I figured out eventually about that was that, well, okay, it was true that women were more likely to have economic. Um, you know, be the breadwinners, as they were called, um, in households in those days. This did not improve women's status. Quite the opposite. That it was since it was so 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 strongly associated with the um, economic downturn and the economic deprivation that families were experiencing. The opposite was true. Women, um, sorry, everybody longed for the good old days when men were the ones who earned more money, etc. Um, so again, you'll see there some parallels today. Um, uh, that's just a quote from um, a different book, actually. There were a whole bunch of books written about this at the time. Um, again, they were sort of buried and forgotten, but you know, 
there's some kind of secondary literature, but you can say this example of um, a case where um, this was a, a necessity, but not something that people looked on. Um, there were many other things that happened as a result of the depression in terms of family dynamics. Marriage rates fell pretty dramatically. Um, divorce rates fell, although people um, left each other, mostly men with women, quite commonly. Birth rates fell. And actually, um, that was the one time in recorded um, demographic history when um, there, were, there was a permanent uh, decline in childbearing among that generation of women. In other, in smaller economic downturns, there's usually some effect on birth rates, but people trying to make up for it later, that didn't happen. Part of this is such a long thing. Um, of course, this is familiar to us today, too. Families doubled up. That means they moved in with each other across generations. That was a very common response. Um, and then the other thing, less true today, but not completely gone. Um, so I already talked about women being more likely to be employed, but they also did more unpaid um, work in the home as a result of the depression, making up for, um, instead of buying a commodity, they would um, you know, do stuff themselves. So um, in, in those days, it was cheaper to make your own clothes. That's not really true anymore. But um, as well as you know, various kinds of food processing, as we might call them now, um, canning and baking and stuff like that, as well as taking in lodgers. So creating income through, or saving money through these various needs. So that also meant women were working harder on both ends, of the, both in paid and unpaid work. Um, and their labor force participation increased. So not for everybody. In okay, so the other, um, the other thing, which um, is more, is very different from the current story, is the um, idea, the kind of cultural backlash against women's work. So women's employment had been growing quite dramatically, well, not by later standards, but in the early 20th century, leading up to the 30s. And then um, suddenly there's this huge backlash of women, especially married women, should not be in the labor force in this period when there aren't enough jobs. So this is one of my favorite examples, the American Federation of Labor, this is before there was a CIO, um, urged that married women whose husbands have permanent positions should be discriminated against in hiring of employees. But they weren't alone. Um, so there was this Gallup poll in 1936. This is already pretty far into things after, you know, anyway. <laughs> yeah, I love this. But Mary Brown was employee husband should not be working. And um, Gallup himself declared that he had never seen respondents so solidly united in opposition as on any subject imaginable, including Senate people. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very high rate, although I think it's not completely. Well, anyway. So that was the consensus. And, um, it was not just an idea, there were many active efforts to exclude married women from employment. So there were so-called marriage bars that were very common, and that existed before, but became more widespread in the 30s. Um, marriage bars meaning um, excluding married women from jobs. And if you got married, you got fired, and if you were already married, you weren't supposed to be hired. Um, and this was especially true in the public sector, so school districts, the data are kind of spotty on this, but Claudia Gold has documented it in great detail that the numbers went up significantly in the 30s. Then there was this Federal Economy Act that um, legislated the same thing. Um, uh, private sector employers did this sometimes too, particularly in white collar jobs. And there were there's stories in the, you know, from the time of women taking off their wedding rings as they entered the workplace, that kind of thing. So people evaded this too. But the, the point is there was a big consensus and a lot of effort to exclude married women, especially, however, out of economic need, married women's participation actually went up in, in the depression decade, as you can say, quite significantly. Um, so there's a kind of gap between the ideology and the reality for, um, as, as often the case, I guess. Um, well, so you'll see that my punchline when I get to the contemporary stuff is that um, one of the um, one of the issues I'm really interested in in relation to this comparison is um, the issue of inequality among women, class inequalities among women. Um, and that's a little trickier to study in the 30s than it might seem today. Or maybe it's the opposite, but anyway, it's very different because, um, well, you all know this, that the, um, what happened in response to the Great Depression, of course, was what some people call economic historians have labeled the Great Compression. If you are a Paul Krugman fan, you might run into this term because he uses it too, but he did not originate it. Um, 
So, of course, as a result of the New Deal, that's what happened, right? This is the period when, the, the one period in US history when income inequality was reduced quite dramatically, both, both of, mostly as a result of New Deal legislation and, that con and also unionization. Um, and that continued for several decades until the 70s or so. Um, and of course, in this period, people understood class inequality as connected to the class position of husbands and fathers, not women themselves. Um, relatively few married women were in the labor force, even though all the focus of the propaganda about how they should be excluded was about married women. Um, most married women were, I'm sorry, most employed women were single, divorced, or separated, or whatever, and, um, and the few married women that were in the workforce didn't earn very much, so you could kind of read off women's class position from that of their husbands or, or fathers if they were younger. Um, and anyway, there wasn't, among women themselves, the, the income uh, spread was very, very small. Um, all this is completely different today, as we'll see. Um, also, women did, because they were concentrated at the very bottom of the labor market, benefited enormously from some of the New Deal legislation, like minimum wage legislation. Um, just a few little examples of that. Um, and, and from the labor movement, too, insofar as that raised wages. So people are probably all familiar with the big wave of strikes that occurred in the 30s, but you may or may not be aware of the um, fact that those were not just among auto workers and other you know, industrial workers, but spread into things like retail. So that's, there's a famous sit-down strike in Detroit at Woolworths. That's what that picture's from. Um, OK, so that's kind of the backdrop. And this is the stuff I did a long time ago. Um, and then now I want to turn, shift gears a little bit and just talk a little bit about how things are the same, how they're different in the last 10 years or so. Well, since 2008. So there's some obvious similarities. Um, some of them I've already mentioned. One is the unemployment patterns are really very similar. Um, again, this time, I and mean, of course it wasn't a dramatic rise in unemployment, but women's unemployment rose um, less and later than that of men. This time, construction was the center of that story for all the reasons you already, I'm sure you all remember. Um, more or less similar impact on demographic trends, fertility, and divorce, although not marriage rates for reasons I'm not completely sure about, um, fell quite significantly. So, well, I'll say more about all this in a minute. The role reversals business happened again. It's the sort of same uh, dynamic of nostalgia for the old days. Um, in other words, a negative experience. Families doubled up. They still were doing that, as you know. Um, but also some real differences. Um, so I didn't really have time to, well, I didn't include this, but um, one of the issues was um, going to school. So in the 30s, um, men um, who could not get jobs more often prolonged their schooling. This time it was women who did that um, more than men. But men did it too. Some of you may have seen this directly because a lot of it was in higher education, like in my department. Uh, the number of applications to sociology programs skyrocketed. You know, people don't know what else to do. And I'm not talking about now. Um, and that happens in many graduate programs in all different fields. Um, anyway, but women did it more than men. Another difference, of course, is that there were no direct attacks this time around on women's employment. Nobody said married women should be fired or anything like that, obviously. Um, though, as you'll see in a minute, there were some other um, sort of milder types of gender anxiety. Um, this family wage thing is dead and gone. Um, do people know that term, by the way? I'm, I'm assuming you did. That a man should earn enough money to support a family. Nobody thinks that anymore. It's not really even possible for many decades now. So that was an, an issue, and of course, gender equity is highly legitimate, and um, which is not true. If you look at polling data from the 30s, people thought that women should not be in the labor force. But nobody, I mean, relatively few people thought women and men should earn the same for the same job, et cetera. Um, so enormous changes there. Um, and then what I'm trying to focus on here, the huge growth in inequality generally, and especially, and this we don't talk about enough, inequality among women, and also, by the way, among people of color, but I'm not going to really focus on that. Um, okay, so I'm going to, that's like kind of the big picture on there, I'm going to just say a little bit more about each of these bullets. Um, so first, the unemployment data, I don't know if you can really see this too well, but um, you can, the, the blue line is, you know, I'm just thinking this guy that's here is met, so you can see that their unemployment goes up um, in the period that goes from 08 to, uh, I can't even see it myself, to, um, October 09, so during the big um, spike in unemployment, 
they, well, this is kind of complicated. We have much more complicated measures than we did in the 30s of that. But um, you can see the um, 2008, there's a significant decline. And nobody knows if that's permanent the way it was in the 30s, of course. But birth rates do go down. But what's less well known is that um, this is largely driven by immigrants. So you can see this here. So who, of course, had higher um, birth rates to begin with, so had further to fall. So those, that's the, where the really dramatic decline is. Um, but here's a clearer picture, maybe, where you can see what happens in um, the, the, the long history there. Um, so those baby boomers are here in that. They come in now. Um, role reversals, um, very similar to uh, what happened in the 30s. And here's some examples from recent uh, journalistic accounts of the nostalgia for before. So here's one from the Nation magazine. When her husband lost his job, her boss allowed her to go to 55 hours a week from 40. It's always, well, hours are often the issue. Run his long day, she leaves at 5 a.m. He's gone until early evening. I've altered her role in the family. She still views him, and he still views himself as the chief provider. If not today, then in the long run, when her income, they hope, will again become secondary. So not too different from the, old, the earlier examples I showed you. Um, here's another one. Three days before Christmas, two months after the birth of their youngest child, Kevin was laid off. He and Cheryl decided he should go back to school. That's different from the bigger pattern, but anyway. Cheryl took the only job she could find, $7 an hour at a gas station. Kevin has been doing more child care duties, doing more housework. Yeah, yeah, we would say, but not really. Cheryl says, well, it's nice to have her husband to better appreciate all she did as a stay-at-home mom. She'd trade that for her old life instantly. Well, anybody would, right? I mean, you know, if, if the result is you have a third of the household income you did before. Um, Okay, there's more parallels, too. Um, divorce rates fall. Again, I'm not completely sure what this is about marriage rates, um, but we can talk about that later, maybe. They did not fall in the Great Recession. Of course, they were way lower to begin with, and there's also same-sex marriage, but that's a very tiny part of it. I don't know. Um, doubling up, though, very common in both periods. Um, and then, of course, this enormous narrowing of gender inequality since the 30s. So, we all know enormous growth in labor force participation, especially among married women and mothers. Um, you all are aware, I'm sure, that women have now overtaken men in terms of um, schooling and educational attainment. That's to use a jargon term. Um, the family wage, I already mentioned, is gone. Um, tremendous support for um, gender equity at work. And at the same time, um, enduring gender inequality in the household. I think we all know this. Um, now, now I'm slowly getting to the class point. There's been some reduction in job segregation, certainly since the 30s. Um, though I'll show you some details on that in a moment that suggest it's certainly not for everybody. And yet, of course, soaring inequality um, in this period, which has been unrelieved despite the crisis, not like in the 30s when the response was to do something about that. Um, including inequality among women, which I will say more about. Um, so there was no big cultural backlash of the type that occurred in the 30s, but there is a certain amount of, um, and I'm sure you, you all noticed this at the time, sort of gender anxiety is what I call it, um, after the 2008 crash. A lot of concern about, oh, these poor little boys who are not, who are floundering, and the, you know, the girls are so much more together in school and all this stuff. Um, and, you know, this little spate of literature that came out at that time. These are just two examples. And the second one, I had to end with men. Um, <laughs> you know, book titles have gone off the charts and some of the lately. But, um, yeah, that was written by a fairly, um, you know, sort of ladies' kind of liberal uh, author. The other one came out with the Manhattan Institute, so that's another sort of thing. But, um, anyway, there's a lot. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, all right, so as I mentioned, the, the uh, earnings, uh, I'm sorry, the gender inequality has declined somewhat, and we see that in several, there's a lot of indicators of that. One is the decline in gender gap in pay, so you can see that here. This doesn't go all the way back to the 30s, but so we're up, you know, in my um, saddle days, as I said at the beginning, we used to wear these little buttons, 59 cents, that was the, the typical ratio, all right, those, so now it's more like 80 cents, that's so many progress, so we're not there yet, but still. So again, um, that gap is, you know, there are cases, and I've seen it myself, where um, women are paid less than men for doing the exact same job. Maybe you've all seen that in your own workplaces too. 
but more commonly, um, it's driven by job segregation and the jobs that women do are paid quite a bit less than those that men do. And then it's a no. Yeah. So, you know, the classic example I like is the child care worker and the zookeeper. Guess which is which, right? Um, and who gets paid more. But there are endless examples of that. Um, so part, what's driven this decline in the gender gap in pay is the decline in job segregation, which is this slide. And so that's quite significant. For those who aren't familiar with this, there's a standard way to measure this, which people call an index of segregation. And basically what it tells you is what these numbers are, what percent of people would have to switch jobs for there to be a perfectly even distribution through the labor force of men, women, and you know, people who distribute in any job population. So, you know, that's a pretty significant decline. But, um, let me just skip a slide here. But this is the real story here. Um, this is something Paula England put together. And we could debate her definitions of working class and middle class. I'm sure everybody will have to say about this, for example. But um, this is what's really important. So yes, that index of dissimilarity is what I just described has declined quite dramatically for basically professionals and managers. But it's almost unchanged for what she calls working class female jobs. So that's really important, in my view, in terms of an enormous um, you know, kind of opening up of a gap between um, among women that really was not there in the past. Um, so the gender gap in pay and segregation has narrowed, but not for everybody. And I think that's um, something that we have not spent enough time thinking about. Um, and meanwhile, in the in the public conversation, so to speak, it's all about managers and professionals. So my favorite example is the Sheryl Sandberg book, which I'm sure you all know about, but this is everywhere. I mean, you would think, looking at the public conversation, that most women workers work as, you know, TV anchors, lawyers, corporate executives or something. In fact, if, well, it's a very small percentage of the workforce are in such jobs, and especially the female workforce. I used to do some teaching that asked students like what percent of the workforce did they think of women workers were made up of um, lawyers, doctors, and I threw in academics, and that's what we did. And um, you know, they would give me these crazy guesses. It's actually less than 1% of all women workers are in most of the occupation, which you would never guess from the public conversation. So, well. Um, Okay, so there are other, there, this gets complicated when you start to think a little more systematically about inequality among women. Um, so let me just sort of suggest a few of the complications. I'm, I'm actually almost um, done. So um, one is that the, um, the gender gap in pay does not follow the lines you might expect. It's actually bigger at the top because the male top earners, of course, I'm sorry, the top earners are mostly men, and they really make a lot. I mean, that's the proverbial 1%, right? Um, so even though the gap has opened up among women in, at the very top, um, the gender gap, unlike job segregation, what I showed you before, is actually much bigger. Um, whereas, at the same time, for the majority of male workers, real earnings have actually declined since the 70s, and women have either stay flat or decline less, so the gender gap there is actually small. Um, so this is all also magnified by um, ma marriage patterns, or um, what some people call a sort of community. I feel funny talking about this in Madison, since you've got all these democracy people that aren't too many of them are in the room, but some people are um, very familiar with all that. So what anthropologists call endogamy or homogamy um, multiplies these best inequalities. So we all know that um, People tend to marry with, marry or mate or partner with people of similar backgrounds. So that's sort of pretty well established, and you know, historically as well as today. But now that um, more and more married women remain in the labor force, and being a affluent, highly educated woman means you do that in a much better job than your counterparts generations back. Um, but, but class inequalities are actually multiplied dramatically as well, right? So you have two professionals or managerial types in a household who are connected to one another. This could be men or women, but same-sex marriages or whatever. But also 
Um, and then the other extreme, of course, more commonly, um, a single-headed household with one low income from, you know, so, so that we, when you just look at individuals, you don't even see that piece of it, but th this is, magnifies the class differences among women. Um, and um, marriages and other partnerships are more likely to endure for the privileged women as well. So for a lot of different reasons, including later ages of marriage or whatever. So that amplifies things further. Um, also, we all know that um, women who can afford it are more likely to um, replace their own household labor with that of a, of a paid servant or a domestic worker. Um, though there's another irony here, which I won't, I won't say much about now, but just to flag it that um, there's a, this other thing is that even though um, women who are managers and professionals work longer hours in the paid labor force um, than working class women, they are also expected to um, participate in what some people call intensive mothering, that is to spend much more time um, and effort uh, parenting than their less privileged counterparts. So that's a different angle. But so that also drives the demand for paid domestic labor. Um, now I didn't say anything here about race or ethnicity, you might have noticed, but um, I do just want to flag that and say, of course, there's a strong um, connection between the kind of inequalities I'm talking about and race and ethnicity, but there are also big uh, within group inequalities among people of color that may, make it much more complicated to sort of track that. So the same kinds of class divisions that I tried to sketch among women also exist among African Americans, among Latinos. Right, and so it becomes pretty complicated to um, capture all that in some simple way. Um, the one thing I do want to mention is that as of the 1930s, the variation in educational, I'm sorry, in unemployment is much more extreme when you look at gradients by education or race than by gender. So I'm focusing on the gender story, but I don't know if you can see this, but um, just the variation among white women by education is a, by a factor of three in terms of unemployment rates, so we have to keep that in mind, too. Um, okay, so I'm just going to try to summarize this a little bit, and then um, I'd love to hear your comments and questions. Um, so there, the basic similarities are clear, I think, that um, the so-called, oh, I didn't say this, but that um, there was no historical memory, really, of this stuff in the 30s when it happened in 2008, so journalists invented the term the man session, the he session, stuff like that. Um, but in fact, this was something, nothing new. It just was forgotten, I think, that this had occurred before. Um, the falling birth rates, the role reversals, all these things are, you know, essentially similar to what we saw um, 75 years ago. Um, and the differences between the two periods, I think, reflect, on the one hand, the um, reduction in gender inequality, and at the same time, the rapid growth of class inequality. The big contrast is really that whilst the depression of the 30s led to a political response that actually addressed um, growing inequality, that has not happened this time. Um, inequality instead continues to grow. So, and in particular, inequality among women, which again I think deserves a lot more attention from people in this room than we get. Um, so I'm going to stop there and. Um, I'm supposed to talk for 40 minutes, I don't know if I did that or not, but um, anyway, I'm happy to hear comments, questions, whatever. Thanks. Yeah, some people argue that the Great Depression was more due to World War II than the politics actually in the 30s. In the longer term, of course, social security and other things, and the labor organizing helped to perpetuate the consequences of World War II longer. <laughs> but uh, I think if you actually look at where the inequality really begins to drop, it's not 36, 37. No, that's true. But it's, I think the, le the basic legislation is key. It's true that unionization, which take off more, you know, which have a much bigger effect once the economy really is restored to health, which is the product of the war. But but also yeah. the solidarities of the war helped to perpetuate that longer than would have happened, you know, if it had just been yeah, that's absolutely true. come out of it, it probably would have unraveled sooner. Could be. And the other um, 
claim one could make is that we haven't seen it's not long enough to maybe we'll get some kind of response. But I mean, we are beginning to see things like increases in the minimum wage now, not really making a dent in all this, in my view, but it's possible that I'm being too impatient and suggesting that nothing's really yeah, happening. Yeah. That's true. Let's hope that's not what the solution is this time. But anyway, no, that's a good point. Absolutely. Well, but it's also true that the, I actually was stunned that 1940s unemployment rate was still 15%. No, the Depression doesn't really end until the war. Yeah, and the US no, doesn't end the war until 41. Yeah. So, yeah, no, that's really, that's really right. Really so, so, but we're, we're only eight End of 41, that's right. Yeah. We're actually seven years past the recession yet. So, just wait a little while. Bernie. <laughs> we're not counting on it, but I've heard that argument. Yes. <laughs> anyway, no, we're going to have about papers. <laughs> So, you know, unionization really takes off after the war, too. I mean, it starts in the 30s, but the big surge is actually during the war. So it's very similar in that respect. And that's a huge equalizer. So I've done, some of you know, I've studied World War II in some detail in the, um, in the industry that the CIO focused on. Um, you know, it's like 90% unionized at the peak of the war. And, and tremendous wage compression, where everybody's basically doing the same thing. In that, in those, and that all changes some after the war, but it's true that that's really the big surge in all these things, absolutely. But I don't think, well, we'll never know, but there's no way to know this, but if you didn't have the kind of groundwork laid by all that New Deal legislation, it might not come out that way. That's the other, so I think it's all one thing, but anyway, yeah. Um, I read a study a few years ago about uh, how much time parents spend with their kids talking. Uh -huh. And so in the UK, for dual income families, it's an average seven minutes per day. So I was wondering what the intensive mothering and poor parenting was about. You know, if they spend so little time with their kids talking, what form does that, wow. yeah. does that demand take? 12, 12 minutes here, we're very <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe those numbers. I don't know where, you, where those are from. It was from, apparently, but... you know, watch in hand, so. I'm sorry? It, it was apparently with, you know, with really measured with watches. So that even the parents were really shocked when they, when they, you know, read the results of their own practices, they wouldn't realize how little they actually talk with the kids. But anyway, well, I, I can so the, the research on intensive mothering, the, the best single piece of work is this book by Annette LaRoe called Unequal Childhood, which shows that it's not about talking, <laughs> but presumably there's talking going on all the same time as these other things. That, um, okay. You know, that the expectations, and she, she argues in this sort of Borgesian way that this is about class reproduction anxieties among the parents, that, that affluent families um, invest much more, and this is basically the women who do it, um, much more effort in, you know, structuring their kids' lives, creating a million activities. And I, I myself have experienced this as a parent. You know, one day there's the piano lesson, and the next day the tennis lesson, and then uh, on and on. And um, that, you know, we're because kids don't get this because mostly because of the money reasons, but, uh, wow, well, that's one part of it. Um, and then there's all that literature on the class differences and exposure. I don't know about talking, but to um, words, big words, and um, reading, and having books in the house, and all this. I mean, this is not really a new thing. The, the intensive mothering is relatively new. But the idea that, um, you know, people from more educated households get more exposure to um, various kinds of verbal stimulus and all this. Um, of long standing. But I was just pointing out the irony of that, that, um, you know, the, the other divide is that, so all the talk about work family pressures and everything is really, that's the, and the Cheryl Sandberg stuff. Again, it's about professionals and managers. So in, in those kind of jobs, women are expected to work very, very long hours. And if they are parents, it's an explosive combination to do intensive mothering and also that kind of work. Whereas working class women are trying to get more hours, actually men too. Um, think about industries like retail and restaurants where, especially today with this modern techno technologically enabled scheduling where somebody might be on the payroll, but if people know Susan Lambert's work on this maybe, um, you know, they, they're on the payroll but they might work 15 hours and they really like to work 35 in, you know, the gap or wherever. Um, that's not a problem that the female corporate lawyer faces, right? So that you get this vast, disparity in and yeah. Yeah, I was just gonna say, uh, Lesman McCall's been doing some really interesting work on this. And one of the things that she points to that I find fascinating about this in terms of the you were pointing out about the depression doubling up the burden and things like that, is that 
uh, especially for college educated women, but for all women, uh, employed women now are spending more hours in housework and childcare than non-employed women were spending in 1970. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that generalized nostalgia anxiety about class reproduction or family survival or whatever it is, is doubling up that burden in ways that you could compare the Great Recession with the Great Depression mm -hmm. more explicitly in that regard. Mm -hmm. well, Leslie is one of the few people who has actually done really some you great know, numbers detailed on research on Well, not only on that aspect, but on the class inequalities I was talking about. Yes. It's hardly anybody else has touched it. She's done great work on that. She's my new colleague, by the way. She's about to join oh, us at CUNY. Okay. I mean, uh, not quite yet, but in a year. So um, that's very exciting. Yeah, she's an exception that way. But doubling up, by the way, I was referring to something else, so people moving into no, thing. But I, no, anyway. I, I, I yeah. meant the, you know, the double day kind of yes, argument. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh -huh. as intensifying in situations of the not just pushing women into the labor market. In this case, since women were working in relatively high numbers anyway, either increasing their hours in paid work when they can, or also now increasing their hours of unpaid work um, out of the class anxiety piece. Yeah. Uh, the, the net, the total number of hours of paid work and housework combined has been rising for women more than for men. Yeah. No, that's right. And so the, that's the American time use data is where you can get all yeah. that. So I don't know if it's talking business, but there are <laughs> no, <laughs> things on the front. No, so they the American time use data, which is sort of the best minutes counts we have now, suggest that that's plausible, especially because of the increased time in primary child care of fathers. So I wanted to ask a question about the, the um, gender segregation of work for middle class and working class mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. So can you, why would working class jobs be so much more segregated? So that's one question. Like that's really striking. Mm -hmm. And the other question is, is that likely to change at the top end of the, I'm just thinking of the number of men I know who've gone into nursing and how much that's been visible in the last few years. I'm just thinking, I wonder if it's not, so there would be the professional group, of course, but... But, the, but yeah. it was a working class or middle class. I don't know. That nursing's a tricky one because yeah. it requires a fair amount and there's all different kinds of nursing too. But, you know, the RNs have usually a four-year degree and so they're sort of in the, that top 30% or so. Yeah, so but, I know what RNs are. Yeah, but anyway, but it's a very good question. I mean, I'm not, I only know part of the answer. One, one piece is this, which is, this is at the very top, not so much nursing. But if you think about the credential professions that most of us in this room are part of, um, there's been much more change in terms of breaking that segregation than in any other field. And I, I think that's even, even management. If you think about um, why, it seems to me like what that's about is that the ticket to entry is through education. And it's actually, you know, even though there's plenty of inequalities in education, compared to the labor market, it's pretty minimal. And so if, if what you need to do is get law schools and medical school to admit women, and other people too, and women in particular who, you know, you know, don't face the same obstacles as other disadvantaged groups, right, once the doors are open. So there's been enormous changes there. Um, in those, that 1% I was talking about before of the credential, you know, the top credential professions, it's much less true in management, by the way. There are a lot of women in management, but much, you know, many fewer at the very top. Um, and there's, there's job segregation internal to all those fields, so I don't want to make it sound like it's all great. You know, we all know this, but men are still the brain surgeons and the women are the pediatricians now or something, but, you know, 50 years ago there weren't women in any of those. But so, so you see much more change at the top in that regard, whereas in, you know, think about child care workers who are, you know, nursing's changed a little, it's still overwhelmingly female. Um, uh, wait, well, no, what I was thinking is that there's retail, this, right, that, yeah. that it's really interesting that men would be, as men, wages drop and men will be into the best of the female jobs, whereas women aren't going into construction. No, women are going into construction, that's right. Women are, have moved, there are some jobs that have changed, you know, but they, that, then they often tip completely and become all female, right? So that's also happened. But, but at the, yeah, well, for, I, I mean, I don't really fully understand why, except the only piece that makes sense to me is this education as a pathway thing. Like, that's, like, really different than other kinds of employment. But outside of, and, you know, accounting would be another example, which has flipped. That's become a female thing overwhelmingly now. 
um, for the younger piece of it. Right, but, but for the, the so-called pink color ghetto that we all used to talk about, you know, that's pretty much intact. And like you said, construction. Um, and then there's a public-private sector thing here too, of course. So matter much more, if, I, I just know this from my stuff on the labor movement, if you look at the, union, the, the unionized workforce, which of course is a tiny part of the workforce now, it's, it's completely sex segregated too. So the men are overwhelming the building trades, that's what made me think of it, when your question, and women in public sector jobs, right? So, the other men in the public sector too, but yeah, so retail, think about that too. I mean, there's, it's not like nothing's changed there, but it's much less dramatic than at the top. Yeah. Uh, it's just, just sort of the anecdotal observation. I just also feel like it's partly because women tend to be in a lot of service, uh, service professions and helping professions. So those are, you know, serving people with money continues and helping people who have no money, you know, grows and that it, as, as other wage inequality grows and like construction jobs will dry up in a recession whereas there are more people who are desperate who need social workers, for example, and there are still, plenty, you know, the people who have money are still there to be served in these service professions. And I just, I feel like, I mean, I'm just like thinking, well, you care know, from, from another example, right? Another huge category yeah. that's totally care about that and get it and grow up like crazy and mostly very low pay. Yeah. Other exceptions, but. And then I just say guess about why marriage rates didn't drop. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, insurance is such a necessary component for everybody, even more so. More recently, I feel like that does drive a lot of people getting married these days. So. Oh, I did get health insurance. I see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so, pretty much yeah. most people. I, I hadn't thought of that. That's a good point. Uh, that could be part of it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. uh, I have a question. Um, how many managerial jobs? It seems to me that the the relation between the real times, you know, the, the amount of hours you paid versus the actual time that you're working. That, that there's no relationship anymore, right? So you get like a 40 hour week officially, but people don't leave offices before 7 or 7.30. Well, this is at the top, not at the anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's probably also true for the woman in that, in that layer, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's actually reflected in studies, because how would you know that if you... Well, the tiniest uh, data show that. We know that women... Okay. Um, so there's a, well, if you're interested in this, that there's a, it's kind of old already, but there's this book called The Time Divide by um, Kathy Burson and Jerry Jacobs that shows this enormous class disparity. So that's based on not like official, you're right, it's not necessarily tracked in the official hours, although there are government data that try to do it. Um, anyway, it's a big disparity. And of course, those in those um, so-called exam jobs, people don't get paid extra if they work long hours, whereas in working class jobs they do, which is one reason that employers prefer to have more workers rather than to let people work more than 40 hours because they don't want to cut the time in half. So, so that amplifies it even further. But that, yeah, and it's definitely true across the gender divide. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what you think the effect of the Great Recession was on, and the, because the trends you showed, everything we've talked about with inequality has been pretty much before, in place yeah. since the 70s. And, so I'm looking for the for the recession's impact, um, other than the ideological, mm -hmm. you know, similarities that you talked about with the Great Depression. So it just accelerates the previous trends, really. It's not like you're right. This all this starts much earlier. So public awareness is greater, but also this is true. Of even small recessions, they tend to kind of obliterate things that you know. Certain businesses collapse that were doing things, you know, in some way that it's no longer really easy to support uh, others, you know. So, so you, so it really just accelerated things that were happening anyway. But I do think they're, um, so you know, I, I agree with you. It's not, it's not totally a story of the recession. Um, what's more striking to me is the, despite all the talk, and you know, great concern about inequality that has emerged since then, which you know, even though it was happening before, people were not aware. I mean, social scientists were, but not the general public. And that's another story, which I'm actually going to talk about tomorrow in a different, a very different way. But um, we haven't really seen, we've seen a lot of talk, but no action really, or very little, to try to do anything about it. So that seems to me like a really striking difference. I think we've seen a lot of action, mostly by the Koch brothers, <laughs> to make it worse, yeah. or to keep it in place. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, in terms of successful public policy initiatives, I mean, there's some exceptions. Like I think this recent, 
Lesson. What? Perhaps they learned from the last year. <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of reasons why, and you know what? Well, I, I don't know. Here in Wisconsin, you're in the heart of the storm. I mean, I, I can't. Think about the difference in the situation of the labor movement in it too, too. It's like part of it as well. And well, yeah, but anyway, you're absolutely right. These things start way before 2008, but they are amplified by it. Yeah. Can you can I sneak sure. in on it? Sorry, my right. Can I right. So, what you said you don't think that minimum wage increases will really affect the inequality among women. Um, well, they will benefit women that? greatly compared to men. So that's in that sense, uh, they will. But. I just think that they're not yet. I mean, this may change now that we're seeing whole states, you know, begin to raise it. But so far, the the numbers are too small, I think, to really make a dent in this problem. But they definitely contribute. I mean, that so that's the biggest thing I think that has changed, and it seems to be building momentum. So maybe maybe I'll be wrong. Maybe I'm not waiting long enough. I mean, like as Eric sort of implied before, could be. Um, I mean, I find that very, what just happened last week is, is extremely encouraging. Although, you know that those things are, they're phased in over a long period of time, yeah. et cetera. But still, it's a big, that's a significant thing, no question, in two, the two biggest populated states in the country. Yeah. yeah, going along with that, too, I think there have been a couple of, like, blog posts around asking the question that I think you can answer very well here. Why all of a sudden now, after 20 years of talking about why does the United States not have any paid parental leave, we are now seeing some movements toward paid parental leave. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, has a lot to do with the position of women as breadwinners and the recognition of that. I think you may be overstating a little bit the demise of the family wage ideology and the belief that we could somehow or another go back to that. I think there are an awful lot of people who believe that that, if only we could get back to men really supporting their families, or we could really pay men a family wage, we could fix a lot of problems in society. I'm not saying that there are a lot of progressives that believe that. I think the family wage ideology among progressives, I mean, when I was first doing stuff about working women and working class, I mean, I got hammered by a lot of the male left on, you know, really women shouldn't be in the labor force, really, this is all about improve men's wages so women don't have to work if you can support the family wage system. That was a lot and they, Yeah. Yeah, no, that, but I mean, that used to be a progressive argument. You don't hear, it's, the demise of the family wage argument on the progressive side is clear. I'm not convinced that it's disappeared more broadly. Maybe not 100%, but, I, you know, I think just the reality has been there for decades now, but, you know, but I think, you know, but I think, but we're finally but seeing policies that suggest that there's a more general belief that women are also breadwinners and need yeah. to be and integrated as breadwinners. But I would, I would say that that's just now emerging and is in some ways like, you know, responsive like unionization and stuff too. Okay, so I have actually studied the California paid family leave in great detail um, since some collaborative work with I mean Applebaum. And that, of course, it's like what you were saying, that starts way before the recession, and that the law was passed in 2002, took effect two years later. Um, it's a little different from reviving the family wage, though. First of all, it's gender neutral, it's for men and women, and that's true of all the recent ones that have, um, you know, there's now four states, New York being the most recent, to, that have passed that kind of legislation, and others that are seriously yeah. thinking about it. And, the paid sick days movement, which is another piece of all this. So there, it's true that the pressures on um, the so-called work family, you know, reconciliation or whatever, have escalated like crazy, and particularly among the affluent. But they mostly already had paid family leave mm -hmm. provided by employers. Like this is the other thing we found in our research is the whole other piece of the class disparity story. But so in the United States, except in those states that. Um, have state programs, which there are now four, although New York has yet to be implemented. Um, the vast majority of people only have some kind of paid leave if they become a new parent or need time off for some other family emergency or whatever, if their employer offers it. And guess what? Employers offer it to managers and professionals and to what they consider to be talent, people they want to hold on to. They do not offer it to hotel housekeepers, unless it's a union. But, right, um, so, um, you know, there's an enormous class disparity there. What's exciting about these new laws is that they level the playing field, except what we found in California in our research is that that's not really true. Instead, we have a class reproduction story because the awareness of the California law, which is the oldest one, we don't have data on this from these other states, 
is very limited. Only about less than half of the, of the adult population is aware that this program exists, even though it's, it's completely universal. There's no minimum employment size or anything like that. It covers everybody. Even self-employed people can opt into it. However, they don't know they have it. And guess who's more likely to know that they have it? People whose employers already provide it because they're employers. Tell them, sign up for this. I'll top it off. You know, you'll get 100% of your pay instead of the 55% of the pay. Whereas young people, um, Young, uh, sorry, immigrants, low-wage workers are much less likely to know this thing is out there and the other ones who really need it. So we're not dying out of the woods yet on this. But you're right, in terms of the polling, that 82% thing about the uh, married women getting kicked out of the workforce, 82% of Americans or so support paid family leave. All the polls show this. The only people who don't support it are the chambers of commerce. I mean, everybody wants it. Everybody understands the need for it. So in that sense, I don't think this is a going back to the old days, though, or support for the family wage, but there's tremendous, um, you know, public support for this, and that's part of why we're beginning to finally see it, but we got a ways to go, four states out of 50, and um, even there it's not really reaching everybody who needs it by any means, so, yeah, but that is a sea change, I mean, you know, even though every other country in the world has had it for a long time. Um, yes? So this is a whole series of fascinating and provocative findings, but what explains it? How do we understand which? What? The, the, the series of similarities and differences from the Great Recession to the, the back to the Great Depression? Mm -hmm. um, the, like, macro structurally and macro sociologically, what's going on that's producing these things that you're, you know, these interesting things that you're reporting to us? Um, as a first cut, is it something like this? Um, there's a partial transformation of gender ideology and family ideology, by no means complete, but partial, from then till now. And there's not a major transformation of capitalist economic ideology. If anything, it's getting more conservative and more market fundamentalist and more reactionary from then till now. So those things playing out, is that what is, does that explain uh, a lot of the stuff that we're finding? What do you think? I think it explains, the second part of what you said, it seems to me, is what I was trying to suggest, explains the, the different policy responses for sure. I mean, in other words, yeah, we have a lot of chatter about inequality, but you know, market fundamentalism this remains in, in, you know, hegemonic, right? And so the idea that we're going to have a new New Deal is just not on the table at all, despite, you know, marginal things like we were just talking about the minimum wage increases and all. And those are, of course, coming from below, not from policymakers so much, right? So in that sense, I, yeah, I think that's the key disparity. I mean, the other stuff that's much more complicated in terms of what, you know, there have been just enormous changes in gender relations since 1929 compared to 2008, right, that are, um, I don't think it's just about gender ideology, maybe the changes in ideology are more a result of those other things, like the massive increase in women's labor force participation and so on, right, a lot of things are different in that arena that I'm not sure there's any way to like, you know, explain it in a paragraph kind of, but, um, but in terms of the, the thing I was highlighting at the end, though, I'm totally with you, but that's the big difference is that, you know, it's the neoliberal era, if you want, or whatever. I mean, that, which, so whereas the crisis of the last time really did open that up. And I think a lot of us thought when Obama was elected or whatever that maybe that would, we would see some of that again, but we really haven't. Um, although everybody does have to mention it a lot in their speeches, they're not doing anything about it. Tell me, tell me if this is your topic tomorrow or if you aren't researching this anymore, but what um, role do you anticipate for unionization in the low-wage labor market? It's not tomorrow. I'm not going to talk about that at all tomorrow. Um, unionization. Well, so you all, yeah, I do, I definitely still study this. It's sort of a different topic. Yeah, know? that's like, okay. <laughs> so, so. Union density, you know, the measure of what percentage of the workforce is unionized in the private sector is lower now than it was when the Depression began, right? And there's not really any reason to think that's going to change. So we do have public sector unionization rates, which are way higher, although the Wisconsin no, no, no. Um, example suggests that that's not necessarily going to stay that way. Um, though actually, I, Stephanie Luce and I did a paper on this recently. If you look at the state data, Wisconsin is actually the exception. It's not, it hasn't really happened. It may still, but so far, we have not seen a, a national trend replicating what's happened here. So, who knows? And the public sector. But the private sector, we're talking about single digit 6% of the workforce. So, there is the whole alt-labor thing, and the, um, you know, the minimum wage stuff did not just come out of nowhere. That was 
a CIU campaign, um, essentially. It's a little more than that, but right, that's what sort of got it going. So there are there's stuff happening, but it has not scaled up to the point where it makes a dent. And I mean, it's not just the minimum wage thing, but if you think about all the work percent, with that book that Jennifer um, was providing is all about, like, a lot of it is about um, so-called alt-labor, alternative labor, worker centers, do people know about this world? But, you know, the Restaurant Opportunity Center and um, the taxi workers groups and things like that, day laborers organizations, domestic workers organizing. Those are great campaigns and they've done a lot to raise public awareness about, you know, what the issues facing those workers and shining a bright light on all the abuses that are out there. But the numbers of people they've actually organized are remaining minuscule. And so until, unless and until that changes and or there's some sea change in what's possible in terms of unionization, I don't, you know, this is the other difference to the 30s. You know, in 1935 we got the Wagner Act. Now it's still on the books, but it's kind of useless for most unions for a lot of complicated reasons. There's just nothing equivalent to that that's possible. And I think all the, you know, any union official will tell you that. I mean, that's just sort of the reality, unfortunately. So, so that's the other thing. It's not just that there hasn't been a response from you know, elected officials, but also the labor movement is crippled and has not been able to reverse that situation. I mean, a lot of people are trying to think about how to do that, but it ain't happening. So, yeah, so I don't, yeah. So I don't, and I'm not very optimistic about that, though I, I was one of the people who was sort of taken in by the, in 2008 I would have told you, oh, it's all going to get better. I, was wrong. <laughs> now I don't make predictions anymore. <laughs> but the argument you make about it, in, uh, I can't remember if it's in that book or um, What Workers Want. What, what Workers Want? Um, I remember. It's hard to remember all those titles. <laughs> what Works for Workers. What Works for Workers. My invention, but it's a good title. Um, but, right. but actually, there is an argument that um, the doing this, getting the laws changed, bringing the state back in, uh -huh. as you just said, is what happened in the 30s that the laws get in place and then the union organizing takes off. And what happened after 2008 is that Obama wasn't able to. And the labor movement was promoting laws which did not pass. That's right, yeah. Well, so, so we haven't seen, I mean, yeah, so there are a lot of reasons for that, but that's the reality, right? It hasn't happened. So there was EFCA, do people know about this? The Employee exactly. Free, the unfortunately named Employee Free Choice Act, which um, came very close to passage, actually, but did not, which would have maybe made a difference in this regard in terms of um, making the because it would have changed the less character of the union elections. Right? It would have allowed. Um, this is now we're getting into inside baseball for people who don't know about the union world. But um, it would have made the kind of Canadian system of what's sometimes called card check legal in the U.S. So in other words, um, instead of these elaborate uh, election campaigns where the employers have learned how to kind of manipulate the system in ways that make it extremely unlikely for unions to win, you could just simply show a simple majority of people in a workplace supported that wanted the union and then that would be automatically recognized as, you know, so that would have made some difference. Um, the truth is, there's hardly any union organizing going on now. But I with mean, that in place, yeah. there might have been. Yeah, yeah, of course, but I mean, it, it, absolutely, maybe. But anyway, it didn't happen, and, um, <laughs> and it isn't going to happen. I mean, I, so what we are seeing now, and this is sort of interesting, I'm related to the stuff that's happening in you know, the part of the world that gay studies more in the global south. And I'm thinking of, um, some of you might know Reno Agarwal's book, um, what's the name of it? Dignified. Anyway, she shows that in India, low wage workers have, against all odds, succeeded in organizing in various ways. And they, knowing that their employers are often as impoverished as they are almost and can't really afford to make major concessions, they direct their demands at the state. And I think that's what these minimum wage campaigns are like. So, in many ways, that's happening here more. So we get the campaigns for paid sick days laws, for minimum wage laws, and, and the arena of struggle is not so much, you know, can you win a union in your workplace, but can you get a minimum wage law in your town or in New York State or whatever. Um, and so, and there is a union piece to that. I mean, not all of them, but a lot of those campaigns are being led by organized labor, or at least financed by it. Um, so, yeah. Well, and women do disproportionately benefit, sorry, from those things because they are still clustered at the bottom, you know, disproportionately. But lots of people benefit too. And the, the lower inequalities in the strongest social democratic countries is it, not so much from the direct effect of unions on wage compression in the labor markets. It's because of all the state stuff. 
Absolutely. It's right. Really, so that's another true. route. And that I feel like there there are more there's actually more promise maybe, although you know there's a war going on over that too. So uh, you may have seen this in the news, all these states that are passing um, preemption laws so that their cities can't right. does that just happen in Alabama? So that a city is not allowed to pass its own minimum wage increase. They have to, you know, you have to win it at the state level, which is pretty difficult in the South. Right. So there's that there's a whole arena of struggle there that's emerging. Um, but it is more about that than about winning unions recognition, which is really hard to do in the private sector. I mean, any employer who's willing to invest a little money can pretty much stop that nowadays, unless they're like completely incompetent, which some are. There's a report that just came out, it's called Not Alone. Uh -huh. And it's about the self-organization of the self-employed. And I can give you one example, which I'm quite enthusiastic about. It's in Belgium, I'm from Belgium. It's called smart.be and it's smart.be um, yeah, organization call themselves not by their website. Um, and it's an organization which has 65,000 members and you know Belgium is a relatively small country. And so they found a legal hack which allows self-employed people to declare themselves as being salaried by smart. Uh -huh. So they have all the protection of the, of the, of the social state. And then they get, uh, they do the, the invoicing for the freelancers, and they get paid within a week, which is a miracle for a freelancer. And so these are new type of organizations which are described in this report, which I really recommend. I don't think it talks about gender in particular, uh, but it's very interesting because one quarter of the population, at least in Europe, like in the Netherlands, is, uh, you know, officially self-employed. Uh, of course, there's a lot of fake self-employment. But there's also real self-employment, right. and and so I think after a long delay of two decades, they're actually now starting with a new type of organization. But they're not unions; they're they call them labor mutuals. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're more like our alt labor organizations. One of which is the yeah. profile in that book is the freelancers union in New York, which is a similar yes. kind of organization. Yeah. They, they um. don't necessarily demand things from you know employers. Mm -hmm. So they, they don't always act as unions, but they do have a real effect on the on the welfare of them. Mm -hmm. Well, so we're beginning to see stuff like that also among you know in some cities among Uber drivers, for example. Yeah. There are all kinds of things like that sort of like, and you know we'll see what comes of that. But um, yeah, the, I don't know about in Belgium, but the number the hype that you hear about the scale of that of the gig economy and all is largely hype, at least in the U.S. So you know there are people beginning finally to measure it a little more rigorously. And, it's there, but it's, well, the on demand stuff in the U.S. is less than, less than 1% of the That's Uber and then things like it. So according to this thing that people may have seen by um, uh, Alan Kruger and Seth Harris. So, but anyway, there's a lot of activity in that sector, absolutely, here too. Um, it's a little different from Belgium and the rest of Western Europe in that when you were saying about the social state, you know, we don't really have that. In this country, we have employment at will anyway, so people don't have that many rights associated with employment as they do in Europe. They're, everybody's on an open-ended contract, right? So um, that makes it tricky to make those comparisons across the Atlantic. But, um, but there is organizing going on in those groups. The freelancers is really pioneering a lot of it. Um, their original gig, what a gig, I shouldn't use it that way, that's what they call it, the gig economy. Their original focus was actually on finding ways to provide portable benefits for freelancers. With Obamacare, that's less necessary, and actually they've been unable to sustain that piece of what they did. But what they're doing right now is they are trying to, it's just what you said, they're, they're trying to get a law passed in New York City at the moment that would um, give, create a public agency to enforce prompt payment and, um, and wage theft and that kind of thing. Um, I don't know if it would pass it, probably will. But, you know, and there's the enforcement problem. But, so there is some activity along those lines too. And it's not about gender, but it's important nevertheless. And there are plenty of women in this sector. I mean, yeah. The, there's a lot of exaggeration though in the growth of that kind of employment. I think the, the precarity issue, which is, you know, is real. There's also like much greater increase in people sort of perceived insecurity, even in standard forms of employment than in the past. And probably less and probably that's based on reality, although it's very, very squishy, really hard to get a decent data on all that. But a lot of people are trying now. Yeah. So, okay, can I go back to the gender? Sure. I'm just, I'm still struck by the working class. That table? With, the, with yeah. the working class. Um, this is job segregation? Job segregation. Yeah. 
And, and I'm wondering whether the um, jobs for women aren't ones. I'm just assuming about the insecurity stuff, if there's a gender difference in um, insecurity at work, like people who are working as home care. I, I, don't I don't know. I haven't seen any good data on that. Maybe. I, it's not obvious. I mean, construction is pretty insecure, too. That's true. Right? Like, um, I think it pervades the workforce mm -hmm. myself, but I, I don't know. And, the, and well, yeah. actually, those data on what happened in the crash suggest the opposite, right? That, but there's no way to. Yeah. yeah. I think it's really diverse within both the male yeah. and female labor markets myself, but I haven't seen any good studies of that. I don't know if anybody else has. Myra? Yeah, I think. Uh, Don Tomasco with Debbie has an argument at least that we're leaving out the employing organizations too much and that one of the differences is uh, whether you're in a bigger or a smaller, you're working for a bigger or a smaller employer. Differences in? Mm -hmm. What, what, what does that make a difference in? What is the claim? In, gen in uh, gender segregation. Uh-huh. Um, that which ones are more segregated according to him? I don't, I don't know. The sm part. That smaller employers are more segregated they hire women or men or they they have more pattern gender inequalities than some of the bigger employers huh um, that's kind of intuitive isn't it i mean yeah you just think because they're smaller they have to be more flexible or something but i don't know how small he means by small that would be yeah yeah, yeah I, I don't either i just remember him talking about the that there are different patterns of gender segregation depending on mm -hmm. some features of the organization, and besides public-private, obviously, oh, sure. uh, so the size of the employing organization mm -hmm. was one of the ones that kicked in. I may be misremembering the details of how it worked, but... I mean, bigger organizations are more vulnerable to suits around discrimination, and... Segregation is not illegal in any No, way. I know, yeah. but, I know, but they're, they do have... Um, Compliance officers mm -hmm. who are concerned about, you know, there's all sorts of things that happen there that won't happen in small. Um, you know, another thing that seems to be bubbling just below the surface now is um, people are talking about basic income. Uh huh. I recently gave a talk in San Francisco, and the first time in my career, in the middle of a talk, when I mentioned unconditional basic income, the audience broke into cheers and applause. <laughs> Which I, you know, I sometimes can get chuckles out of lame jokes, but I've never gotten applause in the middle of a lecture mentioning a public policy. <laughs> uh, and so certainly in the Bay Area, in Silicon mm -hmm. Valley, there's, it's on the agenda that people are talking about. Yeah, people are talking about it, mostly in the elite, but yes. Yeah. This, this, this was a, wasn't an academic lecture, it was the community. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about this in New York? It's the yeah. it was the Silicon Valley types. Yeah, the Silicon Valley yeah. types, but it was rank and file Silicon Valley types. Mm -hmm. not. I'd be very surprised if that becomes uh, policy anytime soon in this country, but it's encouraging that there are people talking about it. Yeah, and this is provoked by the gig economy stuff. And I'll talk about precarity and people, you know, and and also by and this is why I think it's in Silicon Valley. It's also provoked by the kind of robots are coming discourse, which personally I think is nonsense, but I mean the robots are coming, but I don't think there's going to be mass unemployment as a result. But people who believe that there is, which is a lot of the right. high tech types, um, think, well, what are we going to do about that? We'll have revolution if we don't, you know, buy people off of basic incomes or something. That seems to be what's driving it. Um, anyway, but, yeah.